So let's go ahead and get started. We have quite a few that have joined us already. Um, so I'll go ahead and get us started while um, others may be continuing to join us. So welcome everyone to the, the G4 Alliance Burns Working Group. Yeah, just now I see the video. Yes. I would like to ask that everyone please mute um, when you're not speaking so that we can all um, hear. So we're delighted to have you all join us today. Um, our focus is on the crucial theme of leveraging partnerships for equitable access to burn care. And this topic is highly intriguing, interesting, and um, despite its significance, it hasn't received adequate attention or thorough investigation. And so I'm sure that it's um, piqued everyone's interest here today. So we're truly excited to have our esteemed speakers here to share their experiences with us. So uh, just to go over our presentation format for today, um, each speaker will have the opportunity um, to present and we encourage you to type your questions in the chat box throughout the session. And then once the presentations conclude, um, sorry, we just changed. Um, once the presentations can, um, conclude, we'll have approximately 15 minutes or so for um, a, a discussion and Q&A session. So without further ado, let's extend a warm welcome to our distinguished speakers for today's session. Um, Dr. Rose Aligno is a plastic surgeon at Kurudu Hospital, bringing her expertise to the forefront of burn care. Natalie Myers holds the position of Chief Program Officer at uh, Research International, bringing her expertise and dedication to the field. And Dr. Matthias Botman, he's the head of reconstructive surgery at Amsterdam University Medical Center, and also a team member of Interplast Holland. In addition, he serves as the general director of Global, Global Surgery Amsterdam, and he and his team um, were with us for our, our our last series to talk about um, their projects. So once again, thank you all for being part of this support, important event. And let's make this session impactful and meaningful to the advancement of equitable access to board care. Now, should I start my presentation? Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Rose. Right. Thank you very much, uh, the organizers, and thank you for inviting me to give this uh, presentation. And uh, I also appreciate my co-presenters. Uh, uh, I hope it will be a fruitful discussion. So I am a plastic surgeon, as mentioned, and I've worked in the BANS unit in Uganda for about 13 years. Uh, learned most of the work on bands on the job, but also from my seniors and the band surgeon and reconstructive surgeons that visit us. But I'm not seeing the slides. I think we're next slide. Oh, next slide, please. Okay, that's uh, Chirudu Hospital is uh, located in Kampala. It's the second Second National Referral Hospital. Uh, for those of you who have been to Kampala, it's located close to Lake Victoria. It's relatively small compared to the National, Na National Referral Hospital in Lago, much bigger with about 2,000 bed capacity. This one has about 250. So one level is located to the BANS unit and this hospital opened up in 2015. So we've been there for about eight years now. And it's the only bands unit in the country, a country of about 48 million people. But this is the only unit that we have for major bands and its capacity is about 56. But as you know, in our setup, the bed capacity does not usually determine the numbers of the patient because once it's a public hospital, it never gets full. So whoever comes, 
probably has nowhere else to go. So despite those few numbers of beds, we usually admit access. Next slide, please. Now, burns was a disease that was very much neglected in our setting. I remember when I was a medical student, they were placed at the last end of the ward, and most times the ward rounds would probably not even reach them. So there was quite very high mortality, and uh, when they, those that recovered had very severe contractures. So Dr. Rain Zimmern, may he so rest in peace, he, died a couple of years ago, but he used to come and visit under Interplus where he was the chair and was doing reconstructive surgery in several hospitals. Most of the cases were burn contractures. So he thought very hard and said, to improve this situation, we should have a burn center. So together with the government of Uganda and the National Referral Hospital Mulago, a space was created and a skeleton staff was set in, and that's how the Burns unit was born in 2004. And we remember him, and actually one of the ward is named Holland Ward to keep his memory alive. So when the National Hospital had to be restructured, we moved to Chiruduna where the center is. Uh, in our unit, we are treat on average 68 moderate severe burns patient and 60% of, the, of these are actually children. And then we have a few between 80 and 120 cases that come as OPD cases of mild burns. It's estimated by WHO that about 180,000 deaths, but ours on, we have roughly about seven to 8% mortality. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So uh, as we all know, burns is a very severe disease. It's a lot of morbidity and pain, disfigurement and the mortality is very high, but in our in our experience, most of our burns actually occur at home. And this involves children between zero to five years. And we've observed that the burns actually do occur in the homes that are within the slums. In the, in the slums, the housing units are built so that there is actually no space for the children to play. So there's a narrow corridor and that's where the cooking place is. So this one room apartment. And so this choir is, shared in the area where children play. So during the time that the children run around, they are able to, uh, they hit the cooking uh, stove. And this cooking stove itself is designed in a way that it is very light. So when you put something on top, any slight knock, the, whatever is being boiled up will pour on the children. And the second cases of, Bands that we see a lot is those that have epilepsy. Now in our culture and environment, epilepsy is a severely stigmatized disease. No family discloses that their loved one has epilepsy. So therefore they don't get treatment and you only discover that they have epilepsy when they appear with bands. And these are usually very severe bands because um, they're not able to move from the source. So by the time that somebody is able to move them, they've actually got very, very severe burns. And the other option, the other cause is actually arson. People have now learned in the recent years to sort out disputes using chemical burns, and it's easily available. There are no regulations against acids, so they can just buy it from any place and access it. So, and the aim is always to power it directly to the face so that the person is mime or is even blind, is not able to describe his or her attacker. Then the other common cause that we see, we actually publish a paper about that, is most <coughs> patronate funds. 
the mosquito net is supposed to, to save us from malaria, but then it's also a death, death trap for the children because the, the source of light that is very cheap for us is the candle. It's about a uh, hundred shillings, maybe. I don't know how to convert that, but it's very little money and it's bought every day. So the mothers lit this candle and the ch children are sleeping. So they are covered in the mosquito net and the candle melts and catches the, 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 the fire and children are really burned. Most of it is very high mortality. Then of course there are occupational hazards, not very often, but also especially to the male, there is no knowledge about risk involved. So by the time they realize that there is a hazard, they are already banned. Next slide, please. I just shared a few of the pictures uh, of our band's patients. You can see in the corner down is a child that had a mosquito net. So he's burnt and, and wasn't able to move. So he's lost already one leg. And so instead of a mosquito net being a blessing, it's now a challenge for us. And, uh, and the next picture is Chad burned there. Those are the epileptic patients. Usually they come with such severe burns and the prognosis most times is not very good. Next slide, please. This, uh, I've put these pictures. This child has just come in about three hours ago and uh, the, to, he was put to lie close to the cooking fire so that the mattress he, the baby was sleeping on, one year old, hot fire. So if the whole back is completely cooked and the wood is smelling like you know burnt meat. So it's, that is how sad it is for the children in the slums. Next slide, please. So our unit is uh, divided into the general ward, the ICU, but I must say here that for those of you who have come there, it's not an exactly ICU as you know it. It's a high dependent unit, but we still call it our ICU. Um, Burns is very, very expensive to treat and very demanding in our poor resource countries like ours. Treating a burns patient is a nightmare. Every time we treat a burns patient, we are kind of asked, what did you do with the material? What did you do? Because they think the supply should always stay in. So I think as we go on discussing, it's much cheaper for us to prevent than to try and treat. And most of our patients do report late. And this, these are due to various factors because uh, cost sharing is a challenge for them. They need to find how to get to the hospital, the distance, because we have only one unit. And also there's just understanding the idea is somebody is burnt. If somebody is still talking and eating, they think it's not serious. So by the time they think it's serious is when the patient is unable to talk. So they come with even a ban that would have not actually been severe would turn out to be a severe ban. First aid, we, that's one of our biggest challenges. Our first aid care is very poor. We, there are lots of practices that actually make the ban deeper. People think, I don't know who tells them, but they believe that the rabbit hair is very good first aid, urine, lots of things that by the time they come is infected. And then this even makes our treatment for burns more complex. We have shortage of human resource and we have increased demand for blood transfusion and yet malaria is another illness that needs blood and the, the maternal uh, bleeding. So most we do lose some patients because we are not a priority on the list for blood. And of course, we have only one burns unit, as I mentioned earlier. Sometimes it's really crowded. And then the other patients that we still have to deal with in the burns unit is contractures. Uh, in the countryside, the burns are not as many as in the slums area, but of accumulation of cases, because once they are burned, 
they are treated and they healed at home. So they end up with severe contractures. Next slide, please. That's a picture of uh, our ward, which is the female ward. I wanted to show you that the, it's actually named after Zeman, who founded the band unit. Okay. Okay. Uh, the inequities of bands, I think that's what probably our paper that brought this talk and uh, probably Natalie will say more about the paper that we published. There is, yeah, when a ban occurs, it is the women that suffer more. They suffer as victims, as I mentioned earlier, epilepsy, because fire, as we know, triggers the epileptic fits and these people are not on treatment. So they go cooking and usually the, the female is cooking alone. So she gets uh, into the fire and it will take a long time before somebody comes to rescue her. So they end up with amputated hand, amputated loss of sight. So, and then the next is the domestic violence because this acid is more towards the female. If the relationship does not go well, they have to mind their face so that they don't uh, get uh, another relationship. So, and these females are usually stigmatized. They do not have caretakers because despite the cause, nobody knows why somebody poured acid, but if the patient is a female, they will always assume she had the problem with that person in terms of relationship. So somehow, and they spend months and months in the hospital, get depressed. And even if we grafted, they heal, some of them, end up dying out of depression and not because of the burn wound. And then all the attendants on the ward, more than 90% are women. So you'll get the ward is like a marketplace for females. And because they have to stay for very long in the hospital, they lose their jobs, the family suffers, the family disintegrates because of the income. So when we target prevention of burns, we're actually directly improving the life of many women. Next slide, please. Uh, this patient had consent for her picture to be displayed and she actually is the same patient in the article and she got burned while trying to explosion from a gas cooker, but she's lost quite a lot because of this burn. She's been in the hospital now for about six months She's waiting for several surgeries. She cannot continue education. She's lost her job. She's lost her family. So a lot does happen on the woman. Next, please. I thought I'd mention some of the challenges that we faced. I've talked about some before. Uh, in our clinical care, one of our biggest challenges is the ICU. And, uh, especially for pediatrics, because we do not have a single ICU easily available for the children. And uh, you can guess if the child is severely burned, what will happen? You know, we keep on trying our best, but the outcome is always poor. So it's our biggest challenge, and we wish that we'd have an ICU for pediatrics at least. And then we have patients that stay in for a long time, and get so malnourished because we are not able to have an alternative source of skin. So it's a painful dressing in and out. It's, it's not having a target or a goal. You're just dressing and hoping that we don't know what can happen, but uh, it's, it's a very big problem for us. So because of lack of skin substitutes and not having a skin bank, it's a having a toll on the patients. Human resource, we're working on that. We hope we've traveled to the government to improve in, uh, numbers of staff, work space, supply, and of course, training. We have students that we train, but we are only two resident plastic surgeons on the ground. And uh, most of the time we have been depending on our partners, as I'll be explaining. Next slide, please. 
we have uh, external collaboration. We have Interplus, which has actually gave birth to the Burns unit through Dr. Zeman. And from then, they have been supporting us. They have been supporting the training. They have been giving uh, lectures to the students. There has been patient discussion. We've had the uh, Burns course for the last two years that is being offered to the hospital. We actually started with our hospitals in the countryside and the last training we had um, uh, medical or health workers from within the city to try and, and see that if we can equip them, they will probably give a better first aid care when the patients reach there before they think of sending to the burns unit and maybe also be able to treat some to, to help the, back, the numbers coming to Chirudu. Of course, this has its own challenges because we are not uh, following them to implement. And so we, we have to still follow up to find out whether they actually do uh, implement, what they are, implement what they are trained on. Because as I mentioned, it's an expensive treatment and most of the private hospitals around the city do not want to keep funds patients and they visit, they do equipment supply. Actually, our dermatome that we use for skin grafting is really is fixed and repaired by Interplus. And one of the big things that uh, Zeman started was to create awareness project, which I think was funded by WHO. And it was done in an area that was having the highest number of patients coming to the hospital. And we saw the effectiveness because from that particular area, we noticed two things. One was uh, the numbers that we are come of children coming with severe burns reduced. And uh, two, they were reporting within two to three hours because even though they were near, they would still come a week later. So the burns awareness project was very successful. And I think Mark will probably say more about it and of course they offer us exchange for nurses and surgeons to visit excellent centers next slide please this slide i borrowed from uh interplus team because they they from the awareness as i mentioned you can see where the cooking is taking place it's in a whole line and it's the same place where the children are. You see that the cooking is next to the door where the children have to pass in. So it's a very risky environment for children, but with the education, this had been in this particular area has improved because they were taught how to use what is available to try and uh, condone off the area that they cook in because at least that will make the children not to be in direct contact with the fire. Next slide, please. These are some of the pictures for the visiting team. You can see the students very excited to work with the Interplus team. We had in the last visit, we had them for two weeks and there was a lot of surgery done with very successful results a lot of teaching, a lot of award for the students. So it was an exciting time. Next, please. We also have collaboration with research that has joined us uh, recently. They did uh, build for us an e-learning center that we are now able to have a Zoom lecture with the different people, different teams that give in lecture. The students are able to sit in one place and uh, they also do a specialized visiting, visiting camps depending on our interest. And they do that twice a year. They give lectures to the students and tutorials and discussion to with the trainee and the faculties online. They also give us some supply to help us with the theater. They give us smart glasses. We are yet to connect with the mentor. Then they also sponsor exchange of our students to visit other centers in the region that gives them opportunity to observe what takes place somewhere else. And they also bring in other students in the region to train with us and bring in their 
experience. They facilitate the treatment of patients with contractures. Next slide, please. So this is the training room where uh, we have uh, what in his name, but he was there from John Hopkins, the hand surgeon having uh, hand on training with the students. And we have a simple microscope for introduction to microsurgery in the same training room. Next slide, please. It's a similar visiting time, but we had a hand camp with the research team. Next, please. So our uh, way forward in this discussion as we go along is that we are happy with the continual relationship with the Interplast and research. We, we've got timetables that they visit and uh, we identify our needs and we've been working. Uh, they've supported us. They've made to, towards having a better training center and as second to Ethiopia, Ugandan center is a busy plastic center. So most of the trainees would want to come here. So we are happy for that support and we hope it continues as long as possible. So our major current challenge is we need a pediatric ICU. We do not have the equipment, neither do we have the expertise, but we have the patients that need them. We need a skin bank so that we are able to get our patients off. We've been able to get a law in the country that now allows for organ donation, but there's no funding to establish skin bank. So we need, we've not seen a skin bank before. We've read about it. So we hope that we can get partners that will be able to help us set up a skin bank with equipment and knowledge. Training is always a key in everything and very important. We trained locally, but we hope that at least some of the team members should visit better uh, advanced centers to observe advanced care so that Chirudu Bands Union become the centers where advanced care takes place. So capacity building in other, other departments. The physiotherapy has very few uh, physiotherapists and needs to be training the occupational therapy and other therapies that are associated with burns care. We have a kitchen that uh, is struggling due to fund, but we we are managing. Next slide. Okay, the next slide is a good slide. So I think it's time for for me to hold my discussion and maybe we'll continue as the patients come in. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Rose. Um, I always think it's so powerful seeing the pictures uh, brought to life as we're all sitting in our homes and offices and, and all that comfort just really brings it to light. So thank you, Rose, for all your work that you do every day. Um, I will be fairly brief because I think Rose is the star of the show, um, but just wanted to explain a little bit about our work at Research um, and go into a little bit the paper that Dr. Rosaleno and Laura Hemicky and myself wrote um, talking about burns. So next slide. Um, so just to give a little bit of background and context, uh, Research is a small nonprofit based in California We've been around since the 1960s, um, so for over 50 years. And as we all know in this group, that 90% of the global burden of surgical disease does occur in LMICs. Um, and there's just this massive burden. And so at Research, we focus exclusively on plastic and reconstructive surgery and helping to build capacity in that area. So in the US, we have one reconstructive surgeon per 50,000 people. Well, in sub-Saharan Africa, there's one reconstructive surgeon per 10 million people. So having Dr. Rose on the phone, Elenio, Dr. Idris, I saw here as well, the two of them in Uganda with the um, incredible patient burden is just way too much. And they have training, they have to deal with us as international partners. 
So it's a lot to manage. Um, and really we're hoping to increase the number of surgeons who are able to help. Next slide. So the way that research does that is we spend a lot of our time on training and capacity building. Um, so you'll see right now we're sending teams to visit Rose and her team twice a year in Uganda. Um, we do direct patient care all through our local partners. So we actually have a reimbursement model that's full scope for any and all plastic and reconstructive surgical cases and then advocacy and equity as well, trying to make sure that we're supporting our local partners on the ground who are the ones doing the work every day. Next slide. So I did just wanna quickly show our map. I think especially, you know, as we're talking about partnerships as part of this discussion, um, figuring out who is working where so that the burden isn't completely on our local partners. And even just in preparing for this talk, it's been so helpful for us in coordinating with Interplast. Um, so I did wanna share this because anyone who's working on burns, as I'm sure people on this call, everyone is, working in these countries, please get in touch, let's collaborate, let's figure out how to better streamline and coordinate our resources to help, because I know we're all in it for the right reason, but oftentimes a lot of us are working in our silos and parallels. Um, so our largest programs actually in Nepal and Vietnam where we have our biggest establishment. Um, and then we've been working with Rose and Cosexa for a long time as well. And then we have a couple of local surgeons in Latin America, um, Ecuador, Bolivia, and Peru specifically. So probably more coordination with Physicians for Peace and others on this call in some of those areas. So we look forward to that hopefully as a follow-up. Next slide. Um, so this is again, just looking at some of Resurge's data. So we pay our local surgeons for reimbursement. We pay for about 2000 cases a year. And out of those that our uh, partners submit, 44% of them are burn patients, just showing how big that burden is within the plastic and reconstructive surgery field. Um, and within that 68% of those are children and close to 50% were women. Next slide. And we've heard a lot about the situation in Uganda. Um, our largest program, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with Dr. Shankar Rai at Kirtapur Hospital, but they have an incredible burn unit there. Um, over 4,000 patients admitted in this last year, 33% of whom are children, 53% women. So with those numbers and stats, um, it really got us thinking. Next slide. Um, and talking to Shankar, talking to Rose and the people on the ground every day and uh, connecting with Laura Hemicky, who's a global health expert, we really saw, and like, again, me as a non-clinician going and visiting our partners, that there was this um, huge impact on women that no one was talking about. And so that brought us to wanting to write this article and bring that to light, because as Rose shared too, with the care as well, with so many children being impacted, that's also having this massive ripple effect and consequences on the children. Um, next slide. So this, I just wanna highlight some of the data from, um, you know, you can go and read the article yourself, um, but some of the larger global data about why is it that women are so impacted by burns, which is, a very atypical injury pattern than we see in the West with burns that are largely males impacted through employment. Um, but some of the reasons, and Rose covered this as well, is the unpaid domestic work in LMICs, it's 90% done by women. They're the ones at home, the children are at home running around. 40% of the world's population does rely on open fires for cooking as well as heating which is a huge issue in colder places as well, where they leave the fire on all night long, um, which results in burns being the fifth most common cause of non-fatal childhood injuries. And then acid attacks are also something that we don't see large numbers on, but that's largely because it goes unreported um, because it is often women who are attacked and there's such a large social stigma around it. Uh, so I think that's something that's also really worth looking at. Next slide. And then I think Rose really uh, illuminated this really well, but 
burn patients often seek a delay in seeking care. I think she, when we were preparing for the article, um, was even talking about how burns are considered not a serious illness because people live. Um, but then that just exacerbates their injuries so much more. And then they end up having longer hospital stays. Um, burn contractures need multiple procedures. They might live far away from the hospital and just has this massive economic impact on the communities as well. Not only the injured patient, but those people around them. Um, and then there's a recent paper out actually from Dr. Chow Long from Hopkins. I'm not sure if she's on the call, but it actually showed that women with burn injuries um, less frequently receive surgical treatment and more frequently die in the hospital than their male counterparts. So we're just seeing that gender inequity at every single level uh, with burns. Next slide. <laughs> So with that, you know, there's a lot of work to be done, but um, I think we did want to end on a more positive note because I know all of us are working on this, but how can we do that? I think we need better, more and better data that explains some of these huge disparities that we're seeing. Um, so we do have the global burn registry now at the WHO. A lot of the data is not gender aggregated and without that uh, disaggregation, we're never gonna learn what are those cultural contexts, why are these things happening? Um, Rose alluded to burn, provi burn prevention, that's so much cheaper as we all know, and as public health uh, aficionados, investing in prevention is much better than dealing with the injury after the fact. There's small solutions like harm reduction, moving the um, fires up a little bit higher, moving them to a safer place where children aren't falling into them, so communication and awareness campaigns, um, but ultimately, you know, a full multifaceted systems approach focusing on poverty reduction is essential. As we electrify countries, electrify uh, slum areas, even we will be using less and less fires for light and all the different sources, which will be really imperative to seeing these numbers go down. Um, and we need more surgeons and the whole surgical teams, good nursing, good anesthesia care, and especially women, when we're seeing some of that disparity of care for women in hospital, I think that that will be a really big um, indicator that moves the needle on care for women. Next slide. Um, so this was something that Shankar Rai at, at Kirtapur Hospital in Nepal had said, but burns are not simply a health issue, they're an economic, political, and societal issue. I think that's often because they are happening to the poorest of the poor that we're allowing for such um, awful care. And then that it's also impacting women who are often the more vulnerable people in societies. Um, so that's the conclusion on the article. And I just wanted to end with one last slide with parting thoughts um, around partnerships. That these partnerships are key um, for us at research using our hubs, people like Rose as the training leaders. So she mentioned, we have a bunch of scholarship opportunities and regional scholarships where we're sending people to go and study with her and giving her administrative support and able to do that. Um, listening and learning from what are the needs. I think her calling out what her needs are here. This is an incredible group and hopefully we can all start gathering some resources, getting her to help set up that pediatric ICU and we know how many lives that will save. And then I think we have a huge responsibility as the international partners is to coordinate with each other and not always putting the onus on our local partners and being better about that. And I love, you know, I'm grateful to the G4 Alliance for bringing us together so we can do that more. Um, I think really our biggest value add as international partners is our resource mobilization how can we contribute financially to these people on the ground doing the work? Um, how can we support their administrative needs and not just asking more and more of them all the time and providing that technical assistance when needed to get things set up? Um, and then lastly, which is you know what we tried to do with that article is amplifying the work and the stories of these incredible people um, and utilizing our networks that we have, whether it's in the US, Europe, places with financial resources to gain awareness and advocate for that neglected surgical patient. And that's all for me. And thanks so much. And thanks for uh, Matthias at Interplast and Rose for being such great partners.
Yeah, thank you, Natalie, for this excellent presentation. And thank you, Rose. So this is a special. Uh, we have been working uh, aside each other for some time and suddenly we, we managed to find each other in a much uh, better way than before. Because this is a bit uh, yeah, the difficulty of international collaboration. Everybody is busy with projects. And suddenly, thanks to the G4 Alliance Burns Group, we realized that we were working in the same hospital. <laughs> so that's already kind of... Uh, a very beautiful achievement of this uh, this group that we are now together having this discussion. Um, yeah, with uh, I, I'm Matthijs Botman. I'm a um, global health doctor from origin and now a plastic surgeon. But I've been working in uh, smaller and larger hospitals in low resources area since 2006. Um, uh, for longer and shorter periods, and experienced the same as Rose, Rose explained that this burn scare. Uh, uh, that the burn care patients, they are neglected at the end of the ward and yeah, often in your ward rounds, you do, do not even reach to them. And that was also, I think that's something that we have in common that we realized that and we thought we need to do something about that. So I'm representing uh, the, the, the Interplast Holland team here with Kostjan uh, uh, Brogum as president, who is on a leave now. And Yenda Hopi was the, who was the uh, coordinating uh, plastic surgeon in our collaboration with uh, Chirudo Hospital, and I'm also uh, representing the Global Surgery Amsterdam team. Uh, shortly, I can say that uh, with the uh, Interplast Holland is a quite similar organization as research. They even were a kind of the same organization in the past, but they divided in, in, in different groups, doing mostly the, the, the same things in a very beautiful way. And with Global Surgery Amsterdam, we decided in a certain moment like that we want to go become really practical and focus on something more specific to really create something that could be valuable for people like Rose uh, who are working in a, 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 a setting where the, the, the knowledge is most needed. So our goal was how can we help them? Can I see the next slide? Um, so what we did is uh, with our organization to think about what are the most essential surgical conditions that needs support. And the first one we decided to work on was burns. Next slide. Uh, now these pictures, you know, but these are the two different uh, uh, moments, phases of burn care where the, the need is of, of treatment is there. So you have the acute burns and the contractures and for both uh, conditions, uh, knowledge and skills are needed. Next slide. So when we were looking into this problem, we thought like a, an, a, an easy accessible, accessible practical guideline on how to perform the care is, is not available. So uh, put the next slide. So that, there is the ISBI, there is the ISBI practice guideline uh, that you can find online in the, on the internet, but that is, not really a practical guideline, it's more a theoretical guideline. It's quite difficult to use for somebody who wants to look up what to do. Next slide. So what we try to do is to, uh, to, uh, to find a way without putting a logo of an organization on it, but just the topic only, like how can we create information on the topic of improving burn care uh, worldwide? So we need to make something that is covering the essential knowledge and skills and it should be globally applicable so in high income settings and also in low income settings they have the same standards and it should be accessible online and it should be accompanied by uh, people who are able to do the work uh, in the field because it's not only the theoretical knowledge that you can get by um by, by looking up things on internet, you also need to learn the skills from, from trainers. So we want to enable others to bring the knowledge and the skills uh, uh, um, to, a broader, uh, to a broader group of people worldwide to have a lot of impact. Next slide. I promise to, to, to keep it really short. So I can tell you in shortly that we worked with all kinds of uh, experts in different settings also with Crudo National Hospital, but also with uh, experts in other places. And then we decided to create this online platform. And I put uh, the, the URL, the, the address in the, in the chat, so that you can find it there. 
because that's the, the, the right place to, to look it up and to also to help us to see what is lacking, what, what is more needed if people are looking up the, the essential information they need to provide burn care and to teach about burn care. What, what do we still need to improve on this platform? And anybody who wants to contribute or organizations that want to contribute, they can become part of this, uh, th this process as well. Next slide. So this is my last slide because I promised to keep it to five minutes and then we have time, still time for discussions. So this is the, what, it, what, became, what came out of this project that started in, in 2015. We have a Wikipedia part where you can find the information. It's easy accessible on your telephone or your laptop if you have just a question what to do in this situation. Then as a second point, we have cases. So we have a case examples of burns, acute burns and contractures in different part of the, the body. And it gives information for uh, doctors, but also for patients and their relatives to show what happened um, after a burn. And then we have information on the courses that are being be provided. So we provide courses with our team, but we also enable others who are interested to uh, provide the same course, the same standardized two days course in the different settings. And this is what we did uh, in Kampala already twice, and we will do it next year again so in, to help uh, Rose and her team to spread the knowledge on how to treat burns in the country. There's also something really important we discussed, like how to find ways to distribute resources. How can we work with the medical industry to help them to sponsor projects where the, the, the equipment and the tools that are needed to provide proper burn care can be accessible for, any, for everybody. And in the section about us, we can show with whom we are collaborating and how we can strengthen each other's teams. So this is for us kind of a way uh, how to contribute to the team in, um, in, in Kampala, but also for others worldwide, we, we would like to help them to, to improve uh, the care for this important problem of burns. So I will stop here and uh, give it over to Leslie to, uh, yeah, to lead the discussion for now. Thank you so much. What a great presentation. Um, so I'd like to open the floor now to um, those questions and further discussion. So we have a few um, already in the chat box, and I know that our speakers are eager to address any questions that you may have. Uh, we might have more questions than we have time to um, address here, but I also wanted to just give um, a brief shout out to our working group because that is an excellent way to join in this conversation and to get involved. Um, so our working group meets every other Wednesday at the same time. Um, my contact information, so I chair the group and my contact information is in the chat somewhere. Um, I can also post it again if it got lost, uh, but you can um, contact me. We can add you to the email list. There are lots of uh, projects to get involved of and, and to get involved in, and there are also opportunities to create more projects. So we are thrilled um, at the attendance for this um, presentation, and we really encourage uh, collaboration and to keep uh, this conversation and, and ideas and activities flowing. So I think um, looking at the chat box, there uh, were a couple of questions from um, Cameron Gibson, who is a, a vice chair. I'm not sure if he's still on or not, but um, he was asking what relationship does Kurudu Hospital have with medical supply companies? And if there are any plan for burn supplies um, to be available in country rather than brought by visiting nonprofits and partners. Um, so there's that question more uh, for Rose, I believe. And then he also had a question for Natalie, if you could talk more about the specifics of payments that research provides in your model um, to local burn surgeons for burn cases. So I'm not sure if Natalie or Rose would like to go first. Um, Rose, you wanna respond about medical supply availability locally? Yeah, um, we do have medical supply locally. So when I say that people come with, I think there are some things that we don't have locally. 
um, or maybe if there are some extra things that they come along with. So it's not that uh, the units depends only on those supply. For example, the, the dermatomes for, for skin graft, they are not locally available. And when they need servicing, we, we are not able to access that. So Interplus has been helping to do that. And I think that even with both interplus and research, you just top up what we have. Great, thank you for that information. So that is another potential area uh, to grow in support for working in burns and LMICs. Uh, and if, so if, if, I I may, if I may add shortly on that, because it's very interesting, because sure. when we thought about sharing the knowledge by providing the basic of burn care courses, and we did the first pilot in Tanzania and in Bangladesh and in, in Uganda, we, we realized almost a little bit too late that we are tra we're training people in techniques that they were not able to perform in their own hospitals because they didn't even have a Humby knife. So now in the, in the next sessions, we decided with the NGOs that co-organize the trainings together with us that for the participants, we need to provide them with a Humby knife at the end of the course to be able to do the techniques when, they, when they're back home in their own hospital. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Uh, may I may I may I add up, Dr. Goran from Zambia, uh, to the comment from our colleague? Not just a humble knives. You have to. Put, you, we need to look after to, to provide a skin graft blades because even if the doctor have a humble knife locally, skin graft blades that are uh, in some countries available, they are of such bad quality that even the skilled surgeon. Okay, I can call myself skill surgeon. I cannot take a skin graft. So it's a very graft, good addition. And 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 the, and the blades, that's important. Mm -hmm. Sorry for interruption. No, perfect. Thank you for adding that in. Very, very relevant and very crucial for sustainability. So thank you. Um, Natalie, would you like to add to the second question? Sure. And thanks so much, Goran, for being here. He's uh, also one of our partners that we reimburse for his incredible work he does in Zambia. Um, so in terms of research's model, in order to become what we call our surgical outreach partners, is we use the WHO uh, safety checklist, go and visit the hospital, certify and make sure that the surgeon is competent in um, whatever the procedures are. And I think Cameron asked a pretty specific question around what types of cases, but at research, it's completely full scope, anything uh, within the plastic and reconstructive surgical field that then they upload into our database system. And we do a reimbursement model based on time of procedure. Um, so happy to, you know, it's probably a pretty specific question and can follow up with anyone else who's interested more in our model. Perfect, thank you. There was also um, a comment about um, skin bank support um, in reference to Rose's presentation. And that is something that we have talked about within our Burns working group. So if anyone has um, interest and or expertise in that area, um, Physicians for Peace has um, some experience in that area in Colombia. But if, if we really wanted to do something on a larger scale, um, and get into standards and equitable access and things like that. I think the Burns Working Group is an excellent um, vehicle for that. And it's it's a, a project that we have talked about. We do understand the need and we're learning more and more about how that can happen. So I just encourage anyone who's interested in that area to uh, come to a meeting or reach out to me directly and we'll see if we can get something started uh, in that area. So let's see, looking through the chat. Um, I just added, Leslie, to add on the skin bank topic. Um, we helped Dr. Shankar Rai in Nepal set one up at Kirtapur Hospital um, and published a paper about the challenges and some of the lessons learned from that. So um, good starting point for those considering it. But yeah. Just uh, if I can add up, I can add up to that discussion. Uh, it all depends of the countries. If, uh, like in Zambia, uh, there's no, it's not allowed legally to take the uh, cadaver skin or cadaver organ and to give it. So it has to be uh, 
locally sorted out before any participant goes into that uh, that project because uh, if the country it does not allow any organ donation apart from a li living organ like for kidneys then uh, the whole thing is going to be uh, a bit difficult thank you mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and um natalie we can also link that article if you'd like when we send out the recording if that's something you'd be willing to share i think obviously there's going to be a lot of differences um between different um countries and and cultures so it's not definitely not a one size fits all but it is also a need um in a lot of different countries and there's several different ways to approach it so um it but could be an exciting serena. topic for innovation go ahead serena okay i had my hands been up so i just thought i would um oh, I'm sorry I, you um natalie what kind of feedback have you gotten about the gendered aspects of the work I'm just thinking about women deliver how that just happened and i'm just thinking about this humongous component to the climate summit that's coming up in september in africa and the role that gender is playing out in terms of women um and those issues so i just wanted to know what kind of feedback you got or did it has it sort of already started to reap any benefits not yet but we're hoping so um i do think you know i was really shocked again because i was just seeing it more observationally and learning from our partners and then you actually serena put me in touch with a couple people who were studying this for their phd and then stopped because there's such little data on it and again it's not being spoken about um so that you know is just really shocking and we're hoping this little paper can help be a tool to make people aware aware of that disparity well i'm just thinking about since this is a working group meeting i'm just thinking um Shenaman, um this would be a fantastic thing to to sort of preview at csw for the commission on the status of women in march that we go to with the g4 this mm -hmm. would be an awesome side event that we should consider doing at csw the intersection of burn injury poverty and gender mm -hmm. Absolutely. And how international yeah. our working group is at, you know, if we show up, it's not just Europe and North America. If we do a decent side event planning process, we can mm -hmm. engage the Americas more thoroughly, right. Africa and Asia as well. I don't know. I just think if, if y'all are into that, maybe we could, Leslie, could we add that to something we do in the working group as like the yeah. CS target? We'll add that to the next agenda. So anyone who's interested in this topic, which I'm sure many of you on this call are, um, you can please come to our next uh, working group meeting and we can discuss it more thoroughly. We have about one minute left, but I just wanted to uh, say one more word from the chat as far as I've gotten down as a suggestion. Um, we need to find ways to train residents and junior doctors on advocacy and social development strategies. Too often, surgeons are confined to the clinical and research field. So I think that's a really excellent point and um, something that we can continue to discuss. Um, but unfortunately, we have run out of time for today's discussion. I know we could probably go for another hour um, because the topic is just so interesting and you know really doesn't have enough light shed on it. So I just wanna congratulate all of our speakers today for your work in this area and bringing, bringing this important issue to light and jumpstarting uh, all of our efforts and working in the same. Um, so we will make this uh, recording available and um, all of our contact information as well. So you can reach out to individuals if you didn't have time um, to ask specific questions and um, thank the G4 Alliance uh, for making this possible. And thank you all for coming today. We really appreciate your presence. Yeah, thank you. Thank you a lot. Thanks, Let's everyone. Uh, one Good. promising small thing I want to add is that in this group, especially in the team of Kampala, there are some very talented young doctors. We just finished the case discussion meeting just before this meeting where they are uh, explaining their uh, treatment options for, uh, for patients, uh, uh, plastic surgery patients. And we did a session together where we learned as much from them that as we could learn from, as, as they could learn from us. And they are so talented. You should really involve them in this team for advocacy. Uh, also about on this gender issue problem, I, th I think they can be a very, uh, a very strong support. Thank you for that, Matthias. And maybe you can help connect us so we are sure to 
include them in the discussion. Thank uh, you, Rose, Natalie. And Rose will do that for sure. <laughs> yes, definitely. Okay, have a nice evening. Awesome Thank you, song. everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.